John Brevard, you're an architect and a designer, an artist, an investor, developer, an entrepreneur based uh, between Ibiza and New York City. Today, we talk about biomimicry and reinventing the aesthetics of habitations, how nature can inspire us to build more sustainable homes. We also come back on your personal story and how it shaped your vision. Hello, John. Hi, thank, thank you for you. having me. Thank you for being with us. Um, you are inspired by the biomimicry, um, imitation of nature in uh, general. How does it apply in uh, architecture? That's a good question. Well, um, there are a lot of ways that we could apply biomimicry in our everyday lives. Um, if you look at the uh, array of solar panels, for example, if you look to nature to, as uh, an example on how we can structure an array to maximize photosynthesis, or if you look at um, the design of, for example, a B-52 bomber, right? From the section view, it's very similar to certain bird types. So these are just two very simple examples. But we're looking to nature to influence and direct how the best design is because nature's evolved over millions of years and it, it, it knows the right direction. So, uh, to me, biomimicry is just about taking inspiration from nature at different scales. And when it comes to architecture, we have a different philosophy about um, how biomimicry can be applied. Uh, because for me personally, it's, it's been a, a journey to understand, you know, how spaces make us feel. And so that's kind of pulling it back a bit, but, uh, when I was sick as a child, I was in a hospital bed for many, many months. And, you know, we talked a bit about this before, but in sterile spaces, you can definitely smell the smell, the touch, the taste, the, the colors. It, it impacts us and where we live. And my heart goes out to those who recently were, were hit by the hurricane in Florida because mold, for example, indoor air quality, all these, all these um, important elements of our interior space impact our health, the health of our families. So it's, to me, uh, biomimicry is one sliver of it, right? Because the first thing we have to do is address some of these environmental, uh, internal air quality, um, getting these basic needs met. But then as we, we progress, we can start to think about materiality, um, using materials uh, that are carbon negative, using materials that help us feel connected to the earth, um, using forms that um, allow us to feel better within the space. So form is something that we've, we were going to go into a bit on this talk, but when we look at um, creating forms, it makes most sense in terms of the application when it's for example, a car or a plane, because that's a direct application of how the wind works with the form of the car. When, when it, you talk about architecture, those same rules still apply because wind, you have to think about the engineering, you have to think about all these loads and how that works. But um, for, for me, it's about creating spaces that help heal people while you're in them. And so... Yeah, that's that's the most important thing for us. You've shown me like this beautiful project of uh, star-shaped uh, bungalows. Um, they're beautiful. They must be like very difficult to. Uh, it's, it must be like a proper challenge to to build them. And what's the goal? What's behind this project of uh, star-shaped bungalows? The goal of the project was essentially to create a healing meditation space. And um, as it evolved, we thought, well, you can actually embed um, composting toilets within these spaces. If you scale it up a bit, you could, you could have rainwater harvesting. You could have a solar panel array connected to it. And these could essentially be little off-grid homes, but that double as a meditation space. So 
for me, um, it's been about creating space that enhances the life of the inhabitants and testing that a bit and seeing how people feel differently in this space versus in a traditional box. So the goal was not just to create a beautiful piece of art, uh, but something that takes in some of the technologies that are leading us to a more regenerative, sustainable future, integrating those, and then creating a space that enhances life. What um, are the material you use like uh, for sustainability and the one you try to avoid? Well, we try to avoid plastics at, at all costs. Um, believe it or not, there have been great advancements in in different types of concretes uh, using recycled material. Um, I have a friend of mine that's working on a product called Renko out of Turkey um, that's really interesting um, using a composite material because, um, you know, these type of products use a lot of, whether it's recycled materials, they're more lightweight, they're, they're, um, you have to think about several things, several mm. factors when it comes to sustainability. And that's why I kind of hesitate when I talk about it okay. because yeah. oftentimes there's this stigma around like, oh, okay, I'm going to be sustainable. I'm going to drive a Tesla, but you have to think about several things, embodied energy, dissipation. You have to think about, okay, well, do you know it's probably more sustainable for you to keep your current car for the whole life cycle of your car than to trade it in for a Tesla, even though it's a, you know, it's a gas machine. Um, because yes. when you buy a Tesla and no, nothing against Tesla, right? <laughs> but you're, you're essentially, uh, digging up all these rare earth metals, right? You have to ship those rare earth metals to different factories around the world and then those factories assemble it together and you know there's a lot of energy that goes into making them so um, it's the same thing with solar panels right yeah. maybe it's not so sustainable to line the interstate highway with solar panels because you know are they efficient enough at, at the moment to you know and do they last as long how long do they need to be swapped out so you know how many uh, rare earth metals need to be mined for for this solar panel. So these, you know, sustainability is not as easy of a topic as, okay, do this or buy this. Yes. It, it is easier to say, okay, well, plastics are horrible for our environment and for our oceans and microplastics. And we talk about these things that are a bit easier, but when it comes to life cycles and thinking about these types of things, it's a, it's a bit more of an in-depth engineering challenge because you really have to study life cycles to see what is what's the best approach here. Um, so it takes a lot of time, I guess, to study which one is uh, really adapted, uh, I guess, also for the situation yeah. in the place where you're building the... Uh, exactly. So we have, for one of our projects, we have a mine that's on the property and, um, you know, we could use carbon negative concrete and think about how we're processing that to, to reduce um, embodied energy. And so we really have to um, consider every aspect very carefully. And the extraction of also, the way it's very important to watch um, the way you extract the material. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you want to do as little damage to the earth as possible, transport as as closely as possible, things like that. Yeah. When you um, talk about the nature, so uh, you also include, and that's special about you, uh, the cosmos. Can you tell uh, Can you tell us more about this in your vision of a, an, an architect, including the cosmos, into your uh, uh, your buildings and your projects? Yeah. So um, this kind of goes into a bit of yeah, my we'll have contextual a, yeah, yeah. philosophy. When I was young and I had that experience where I, I've always felt sensitive to space, um, I started going um, on a mission to to find to understand more. So I went on retreats to study uh, sacred geometry, electromagnetism, um, earth energies, geomancy, feng shui, vastu shastra, all these different ancient arts and um, astrology. And uh, in, 20, in 2014, I kind of put them together in a platform online called Thosin, uh, which is breaks down the thoughts, sentiments, and energies of a scene or region of space. And basically, you can go in and put your date, time, and location of birth. And um, in real time, it 
uses a parametric modeling tool and the astrological and Vedic algorithms overlaid with uh, a biomimetic form and in real time using those algorithms this this form is created now originally when i was in college and i think when all kids are in college they have they're bright eyed and bushy tailed excited to, to conquer the world but then afterwards you realize that you know nobody really cares you're just a kid <laughs> coming out of college and you have to actually work and go for an architecture firm and you know i did all the architecture firms the interior design firms work and i again. just felt a bit disenchanted but the idea was oh i want to create these beautiful things and and so I did the three letter word for disappointing your parents, which is art. And so that's where I started applying these tools. That's so this Thosine thing and creating it first with art. The idea being to eventually scale it to architecture, to kind of find ways to create healing spaces or healing temples for the future, much like we did in the past. So taking inspiration from the past, these ancient arts, combine them together. So when you talk about the cosmos, it's using the astrological Vedic algorithms and and creating these kind of tuning forks, these, um, and then geomancy, feng shui, using all these elements together to create healing spaces. So that's kind of where some of that that came from. And then we try to reference that in our works uh, as much as we can. So healing, I guess now we'll really have to talk about what, um, what happened to you when you were uh, 14. Mm -hmm. Uh, you had uh, meningitis and uh, uh, encephalitis. Do I pronounce well? Yes. <laughs> and um, so you lost your memory. That's uh, crazy at 15, uh, 14, 15 years old yeah. when you woke up and you had this experience. Uh, I would say terrible, but maybe you you're going you perceive it now differently, like yeah. where you died many times. You are, you went into a coma. Can you yeah. tell us more uh, about what you experienced at the time? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Memory is a, a funny thing. I think that uh, sometimes as humans we we hold on to memories as who we think we are in a way, but they're just um, it's all, often to, the way I perceive a memory is like a dream. You know, it comes and it goes, but. Um, but except for the lessons that we learn from them can be ingrained in our DNA in a way. But um, getting back to your question, uh, when I was young, I, I got uh, very ill and um, started with just a regular cold flu and ended up um, being encephalitis and meningitis, which is a swelling of the brain and the spinal cord and um, had obviously some very traumatic experience, some out-of-body experiences where um, during seizures it left my body um, and they had to drill holes into my skull to release the pressure on my brain. Um, you know, had me tied down. I was screaming at the top of my lungs because my brain was swelled up against my skull and the pain was was unbearable. Mm -hmm. um, after, so the, the time of that- At least you remember this? I, I do remember elements of, of the experience. The pain. Yeah, I remember there are certain things I remember. For example, I was being strapped down vertically, screaming, like, kill me to the doctors because, oh, my. because my head was so, my brain was pushing against the skull. Um, and it was a very, very painful experience. I remember they were, I woke up one time and they were taking tubes out of my stomach or, you know, um, things like that. Um, I remember uh, some death experience being out of my body, uh, but coming back, I didn't have a recollection of my past or who I was really, but there was, it's just a very strange experience. And then when I went, started going back to school again, uh, I wouldn't remember going to school the day before. So it was a very, some it took some, time to, yeah, some people say it's lucky because you know, when, when your kids. You, your parents program you or they yell at you or say something or whatever. And, it, and for me, it was able to kind of start fresh, you know, without that, you know, childhood, whatever things that everybody kind of deals with. So, um, and also if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. So the pain and the suffering is actually a really, really good thing. But, but um, being in a hospital room, uh, I felt the space. I felt connected to, to this white canvas box, kind of scary, the smell, the feeling, um, you know, to this day when I go into a hospital, it's, um, 
you know, get this sensory. It, That's it, what you added here. your own uh, colors and shapes in your head, or uh, and where you develop this uh, need for um, architecture and uh, yeah. spaces. Yeah. So um, during that time period, um, I was having these. I mean, I guess medically called them hallucinations or whatnot. It's part of encephalitis and meningitis. And uh, waking and sleeping was seeing patterns and geometries and, you know, seeing different realms, so to speak. So I became very fascinated with otherworldly, uh, you know, places and, uh, you know, the energy of where we are, it's very sensitive to space. And that became a big theme going throughout, as well as the theme of non-duality, which is was the theme of these series of sketches I did during that time, uh, as well as what we do today, you know, when we talk about community, is non-duality as a, as a personal experience and non-duality as a community experience. And what I mean by that is, um, if there weren't any lines on the map, what will people be fighting over? Uh, how do we go back to community? You know, non-duality in a personal life is um, reducing the layer of self and other because ultimately in this death experience or going through this, um, the idea of, of separateness, the idea that it's just, it's illusory. And the more that we focus on that separateness, um, the more we cause challenges in our life both both personal and interpersonal because we're perceiving the other it's is them versus them but really it's it's all fictitious we'll come back on that i wanted to know so before if your mother told you or your father told you, you that you were already an artistic child or if you loved nature because that's two sides that like yeah. we use a lot now And do you know if before you were predisposed to that or if you were just reborn with, yeah. with this? That's a really good question, actually. So um, everyone in my family said that I spoke differently afterwards. I acted differently afterwards. So before I was like this messy kid just running around doing crazy stuff, uh, very messy all over the place, hyperactive. And after the experience, I became very tidy and organized My parents said that I would be like in the trees all day, like talking to animals and stuff. I don't know if that sounds very strange to me, <laughs> no, but um, they, you know, uh, they just see me up there talking to you know birds and squirrels or whatever, um, okay. and uh, just became much more artistic and uh, acted quite differently, walked differently. Um, so. They say it was kind of like a new person versus versus the old. You are the architect. You've been chosen to be the architect for um, this amazing project of the six senses in uh, Iceland. We are in the six senses in uh, in Gaflankaya. Um, what uh, I saw some pictures is it's going to be fabulous with a lot of nature and everything. What's your relationship with this uh, project? Well, I have a very deep relationship with the project. <laughs> so um, it's it's been um, a very, uh, it's been an experience that really evolves the soul when you, when you take on a project like this in a special place like Iceland. Uh, my business partner and I purchased uh, around uh, 4,000 acres in Iceland uh, years ago. I think it's around 2017 or something like that. And um, I, I went in like the young architect from college thinking, okay, this is going to be a community for the future, this big, bold idea. Um, and then time came in and reality hit and working with the local authorities and, you know, working with the locals of what they wanted and what the nature of the land spoke to us. And um, it took us six years to rezone the property and um being uh being on the architecture and the development side of that is a very humbling process but it's beautiful the way it is i applaud iceland for the protection of their nature and the protection of their land it's one of the most beautiful places in the world 
And our goal is to protect the local community, to enrich the local community, protect the land, protect nature, and these ethereal elements that are embedded within it as well. So originally we had these 4,000 acres and the idea was to plant you know, as many trees as we can, hopefully 50,000, thousands of trees. And the idea is to bring back to Iceland to, to what it originally was. Because when the Vikings came, they chopped all the trees down to build their, their homes, their villages, yeah. to build their, um, their Viking ships. And so Iceland doesn't have a lot of trees. So we're working with the locals to bring back the native trees that were originally there. And um, when we worked with the government, they said, okay, well, you have this beautiful valley with all these waterfalls. Don't even think about touching it. So you're not building anywhere near there. And this is a number one gathering place of swans in all of Europe. We didn't know that when we got the land. So you're not building anywhere close to this coastline here because we have to protect the swans. Okay. Um, the locals, when we bought the land and the local community, they said that there are elf homes on the land. So 80%, something like 80% of Icelanders believe in elves. So um, that became these areas that we had to protect. So we couldn't build anywhere near the elf homes because there's elves That's over here and there's okay. elves over here. <laughs> and um, and it, then they're like, oh, well, we found these Viking artifacts here, here in these red areas on the map. So you go all around there. So oh, really, are you going to make another uh, oh, the, yeah. the end? <laughs> yeah, so they're like, your buildable area is around 70 acres now and like, don't touch any of this other stuff. So so our, our site plans, our um, designs, have gone through this evolutionary change based on the the needs and the requests. And so when you get investors in there, you know, they want to have a flag involved and there's no better flag in my opinion, uh, that, that connects with what Iceland wants in six senses, because what six senses does is they really try to bring in community. So they, there's, for example, even at this Sixth Sense, as I imagine, there's a big staff facility, there's grocery stores, it, you know, you're really creating a mini city. And so when you create this mini city, there are a lot of elements to that, but you're supporting the local community, right? And so um, we, we started working with them uh, a couple of years ago and understanding their sustainable cri criteria, working with Bream, you know, these types of things. And it's been a long journey. It's still still early phase, even though we've been working on it for a long time. But um, yeah, it's it's um, it's a really exciting project, and it's a very uh, beautiful, beautiful, special place, Iceland. And it's going to be connected to nature, like you like. Yeah, yeah. that's why you've been uh, chosen because of your project, previous project, and your love of nature. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, Iceland actually has. Um, a very special energy to it, and um, you almost feel like you're on another planet when you when you go there. Uh, not only does it have the cleanest water in the world, cleanest air in the world, happiest country, healthiest country, uh, low, very low income inequality. I think the lowest income inequality. So it, Iceland is actually an example in a way. I mean, yes, some of it's luck because they have the clean water and the clean air, but the way that they've worked with um, each other as a community and, um, just their attitude as, as a people, you know, they're very straightforward, very direct, um, and very connected to the earth. So it's a, it's a great example. In what way could we say that hospitality could take us to a more, uh, meaningful experience? To me, it's about, uh, connecting us deeper with nature using there's several factors right there's smell there's there's taste there's touch there's um materiality using warm uh recycled materials uh texture uh form i think that these are are, are things that we need to think about a lot because it's it's an incentive structure which is one of the challenges of, of developing versus being a designer or architect because you're incentivized in a way to use the cheaper materials, but the cheaper materials are going to fall apart within 10 years or you need a redesign. But when you build something like a, with a wabi-sabi style, 
something that's very warm, really good materials. Yes, you might want to refinish the wood, but you're not going to replace the wood. It's solid wood, you know, or it's recycled wood or whatnot. So using materials that last, building buildings that last. If you build something that's, you know, very unique and special, like it's not going to be torn down. If you build it with good quality materials, it's not going to be torn down. It might be renovated or whatnot. But I think too often we build with, you know, crappy materials where it's not, you know, just build these boxes and then, okay, we just tear them down and we'll just build something new. And it's like the example with the Tesla, it's more sustainable. Like, look, if you have a house and you feel like it doesn't fit the style, renovate it or what, what not, you know, you shouldn't just tear it down, you know, unless there's some structural issues with it, of course, but it's a lot more sustainable to do that than to. Yeah. Such such a waste in the waste of materials exactly. and everything. Okay. Yeah. So. John, I would like to ask, uh, with the same question I'm asking to all the guests, uh, of this podcast. It's uh, the great harvest of the day. If something easy or simple could be could be done and uh, would change the world, would make the world a better place, what would it be for you? So for me, as um, people are starting to wake up a bit more to some of these environmental issues, to to some of these causes that I think most people at Harvest believe in or are passionate about, which are really wonderful. I think um, the one thing that sometimes goes overlooked that I feel like would make a big difference is is generosity. I think that um, wherever we can during this time, if we can find little ways in our lives to become more generous with each other, with anything that we can be generous with, if you can't afford to be generous with your wallet, be generous with your time. You know, help people that that need help in your local community. Find a way to build bonds with your local community through that generosity, through that kindness. You can tell a lot about a place when you move there and you see how your neighbors act towards you. I recently moved to Ibiza and, you know, that our neighbors embraced us. They were so kind and helpful and generous. And I've been thinking a lot about how we could be more generous to them and doing things, bringing them in for, to our home for dinner, bringing you know, do whatever we can to to open our hearts and for more generosity in our lives is something I feel like would help move, move us forward in a more connected way. Hi, beautiful, John. Thank well, you. thank you so much for being with us and uh, enjoy uh, Kaplan Kaya. I'm grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.